It's an enormous pleasure to be here. Um, it's midwinter in Australia at the moment, so uh, it's always great to come somewhere that's nice and warm with so many friendly people. Uh, I think what you've started here, Paolo, if I may say so, and I'm going to learn some more about it uh, during the next few days, I know, I think what you've started here is a really fantastic initiative. Um, and uh, it's hopefully one that we can all learn a little bit from uh, and maybe do something uh, uh, in our own countries. And <coughs> excuse me, I should also say that I'm suffering from the oncoming cold, probably caught in the plane on the way over here, so my voice is a little shaky. Um, but I, I think it's a, it looks like it's going to be a fantastic program uh, that you have, and I'm really very happy to uh, be able to uh, participate. So, but about um, science now, about, about positrons. Most of the community uh, that are in the room here, I think, probably don't know too much about positrons or about, uh, about antimatter, so I'll try and keep things nice and simple. Uh, I'm located in Canberra. I'm not sure if how many people in the room know where Canberra is. Uh, it's the national capital of Australia, but it's a small, smallish city, about uh, 300,000 people at the moment. Uh, and it's located about 300 kilometres southwest from Sydney and inland. So uh, even though it's our national capital, I don't think it's very well known internationally that our, our federal government is, uh, is located there. Most people seem to think that it's either in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, and the work that I'll be talking to you about has been funded by the Australian Research Council. We had the um, great privilege for uh, a period of eight years to have direct funding in a Centre of Excellence program uh, from the Australian Research Council. Um, so I should start, oh, okay, the fonts are different. Uh, I should start by acknowledging a, a large group of people uh, within my group uh, and in some other institutions in Australia that have uh, contributed to this, uh, this work that I'll be talking about today. And another person that's in the room, Gustavo Garcia, a good friend and colleague uh, uh, who also was responsible for driving me here yesterday from, uh, from, from Madrid. Thank you, Gustavo. But we have a collaboration with Gustavo in Madrid and with Zoran Petrovic uh, uh, in, uh, in Belgrade. Uh, and these are the funding agencies uh, in Australia, in, uh, in Spain and in Serbia. And I'm going to be talking about antimatter and I'll tell you a little bit about how you can, uh, you can produce antimatter. Our antimatter uh, is, is the positron, the electron antiparticle. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about the uh, I guess considerable effort you have to put in uh, to produce antimatter. Another way, of course, is that you can go to this, uh, this company called the Brooklyn Superhero Supply Company, uh, which is located in New York, and they'll, send, they'll sell you a tin of antimatter. Um, and I won't tell you actually what's inside it, but uh, this is clearly a joke. Um, <laughs> But it comes in this nice steel can, and what we like to do with particles, whether they be electrons or positrons, is to get cold particles, to narrow the energy distribution to allow us to do high resolution spectroscopy. So the great advantage of having a tin of antimatter is if you want cold antimatter, you just put it in the fridge, uh, and if you want ultra cold antimatter, you put it in the freezer, and, and you're right. So what are the motivations behind our, uh, our studies for positron collisions? Well, it's driven largely by fundamental uh, uh, motivation. Uh, positrons interact, they're a different charge, they're a positive charge, uh, whereas the electron is, is negative. Uh, so they are different Coulomb interactions that take place. Uh, they're a different type of spectroscopic tool. We can use them as a spectroscopic tool to, to probe atoms and molecules. Um, as with all sorts of scattering problems, we can use them for tests of uh, quantum mechanics and scattering theory. Uh, and one of the key points of information for positrons is that they form this positronium atom. Uh, a positron, when it collides with an atom or molecule, can pick up an electron and form this beautiful complex, a, a, um, a positron-electron pair, sort of like a hydrogen atom, if you like, without a, a nucleus. So there's this mutually orbiting electron-positron pair in positronium. And there are a number of emerging applications uh, of positron-driven processes. Uh, in material sciences, uh, they're used as, as probes of, um, of nanospace, of small uh, nano-size uh, <coughs> pores uh, in materials. Uh, and I guess the reason that I'm here is that they're also used in uh, 
in biological applications. So in, uh, as an imaging diagnostic uh, and in uh, a field called posi, posi therapy, positron therapy. We're really interested to know if positrons form bound, uh, <coughs> if they form bound states. So are there analogues of a positron that can bind to an atom or molecule as electrons can bind to atoms and molecules? Uh, and with electrons, that's, I think, the underlying reason why there are so many people in this audience uh, involved with rabbit is that uh, electron attachment to molecules and then dissociative uh, processes that occur after that are one of the, the, um, the major driving processes uh, in electron, uh, low energy electron physics. So it's very difficult to make our low energy positrons. You, <coughs> you either need to have a reactor um, and make them through pair production or a, uh, a high energy uh, linear accelerator. Um, those sorts of facilities are very expensive, multi-million uh, dollar facilities. So we usually use a radioactive source, uh, and these are relatively weak uh, sources, relatively weak production uh, of positrons. So you end up with, with la rather low intensities. The currents that we use in our experiments are typically picoamperes or less. So 10 to the, mi 10 to the minus 12 uh, amperes, more typically maybe 10 to the minus 15 amperes of, uh, of positron. Um, because the high energy spread that we have from these, we, that's great, thanks, Bella. Uh, we require moderators. Now, a moderator is a device which, as the name implies, moderates the energy uh, of the positron. Oh, thank you. Um, so we take this um, width up here, which can be multi um, hundreds of uh, kilovolts. So these positrons will be emitted from a radioactive source like sodium-22 uh, with a, an energy of half an MeV and an energy width of about half a million electron volts. Clearly not good for atomic or molecular physics. So we use these moderators to um, both slow the positrons down and to narrow the energy distribution. And I won't go into the details here, but we can end up with, um, with energy distributions which are around a couple of electron volts. So we've dropped by four or five orders of magnitude uh, from what comes out of the radioactive source. Um, but as I said, the resultant beams are very limited in intensity. So for electron physics, we might typically use currents which are of the order of uh, microamps to nanoamps, whereas with positron physics, we're dealing with picoamps to femtoamps. So very low intensity beams. Now, 2 EV energy spread is not really good enough for what we need to do with uh, atomic and molecular studies, so we need to do something else. And what we do is, is to cool those positrons um, in a trap. And I won't go into the detail here, but we take positrons from our sodium-22 source, we load them into a trap. It's a, this is all done in an axial magnetic field, very strong field. We load these positrons and we allow them to mix with the gas, a very dilute gas in the trap. They lose energy and they cool to, to the temperature of the, of the gas in the trap. Uh, and that temperature, if it's room temperature, results in an energy distribution of about 30 milli electron volts. So we've gone from something like two or 300,000 electron volt distribution to something uh, around 30 milli electron volts. So six or seven orders of magnitude uh, in change. Unfortunately, we've lost most of the positrons in doing so. We end up with, uh, with about 0.1% of what we started with. So that's, that's where the problems really lie. So out of our trap, we allow them then to, to move along the beam line and we interact them here with the gas that we're interested in studying. So we, positrons, we pulse them out of the trap, probably about 1,000 positrons in each pulse. Uh, and allow them to interact with the gas uh, and then we measure their energy distribution and detect them uh, in a subsequent uh, chamber down here. So this is all differentially pumped vacuum system with four or five uh, uh, vacuum pumps and it's about as wide as this room. Uh, uh, the length is about the same as the width of this room. Um, I think here there's a picture of it. So we have two beam lines. This one here I mentioned material science studies. Uh, looking at nanoporous materials. This is the beam line we use for those material studies, and this one here we use for um, atomic and molecular 
uh, and biophysics studies. And these are our, contained in this, these two cans here is the source of the positrons, which is a, a, a few nanograms of sodium-22. Um, and those few nanograms cost uh, about $50,000. It's a 50 millicurie source, but very expensive. Uh, and there's only one, one manufacturer in, in the world at the moment, unfortunately. So there's some risk involved with, uh, with the uh, purchasing of those sources. So these are what the measurements look like. I, again, I don't want to go into detail here, but what, this is typically what we measure. We measure cross-sections, so basically what's the effective molecule um, as a function of the incident energy of the positron. And we can do this down to very low energies, below one electron volt, typically uh, around down as low as about 100 millivolts. Uh, and we can measure these cross-sections and we can also put an absolute scale on the cross-section. So here, a number of processes. This is one of the very simplest systems you could look at, positron helium collisions. And we see here the total scattering probability or cross-section here in red. Interestingly, this is the positronium formation cross-section. So this is the cross-section for the formation. Uh, and it occurs at an energy which is 6.8 electron volts below the binding energy of, of the atom. So the binding energy of helium is 24.6 electron volts. So positronium threshold uh, occurs at around 80 electron volts, 17.8. And you can see at the maximum, the cross section here, it's about half of the total scattering. So this tronium production process is about half of uh, the total scattering probability at the peak of the cross section. And these other, this other line here is the, the um, inelastic scattering that takes place, inelastic other than positronium formation. So this would be excitation and ionization of the, uh, of the atom. And these very small cross sections down here are for discrete excitation of, of two of the uh, excited states of the helium atom. So it's this sort of uh, data uh, with this apparatus. So what about positrons in medicine? What are the applications and what are the, uh, the ways in which they're useful? Well, they're mostly used in this diagnostic known as positron emission tomography or PET. Um, and also in, in some cases in treatment, but that's not a very big uh, application of uh, positrons. So what happens in a PET scan if someone uh, is suspected of having a cancer or of some other uh, metabolically, uh, metabolic related activity, then they will be given a one of the first therapies that's, uh, or, or diagnostics that is applied would be a PET scan in many cases. So what happens is that the positron emitter, in, in the case of, in most cases in PET, it's an isotope called fluorine 18, uh, is latched onto a carrier molecule, and the carrier molecule is glucose to form this uh, radiopharmaceutical, fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG. That's injected into the body. The glucose carries the positron emitter, the, the radioactive isotope, to sources of high metabolic activity in the body. And that could be a tumour, it could be the bodily organs, or, but in particular a tumour, which is looking for food. The tumours like to grow, so they're looking for, for uh, sugars. Uh, and so you can get a concentration of this radioactive isotope uh, at the source of the tumour. Um, so the carrier molecule, in a sense, helps this isotope to find the cancer or whatever it is that the interest is. Um, these positrons are emitted at a mean energy of around 300 kilovolts for, uh, for, for fluorine, 18. And they thermalize very quickly, and that's through atomic and molecular processes. They scatter, and they have to lose energy, uh, have to come to a low enough energy where they can form the positronium, and then they annihilate very quickly, and we get two gamma rays that come off back to back. And it's the two gamma rays that are then imaged in these PET scans. Uh, and you produce images that look like this. Now, I don't, most of, this, uh, most of the bright spots here are in bodily organs, but some of these other bright spots um, that are shown up here are, are tumors in this person. So it all revolves around coincident imaging of the 511 keV gamma rays that result from the annihilation of the electron and positron. And what we know from our measurements are that this annihilation doesn't take place 
until the positrons thermalize to energies well below typically 100 or 200 electron volts. And they then start to engage with this positronium formation cross-section. If they don't annihilate at energies until they pass through the threshold for positronium formation, they can annihilate at very low energies through um, direct annihilation with electrons uh, in the body or in molecules. And so it's this thermalization process that we're really interested in, this energy loss process between the emission of the positron and the, and the, therm and the annihilation and the, um, and the production of the two gamma rays which are, which are then imaged. And part, some of the issues in this depend on the energies of the positron, so for different radioisotopes, the mean energies of emission of the positrons differ. Uh, and these curves here are for basically the range of the positron in different tissues. Compact bone, which, is high, which has a higher electron density, soft tissue or lung tissue. So the higher electron densities, the positrons don't travel as far before annihilation. But in lung tissue, they might travel 20 millimeters or thereabouts. So we're interested in what happens as the positrons thermalize from these very high energies, uh, hundreds of kilovolts, they thermalize through scattering and then they engage with this positronium formation cross-section. So what we're interested to do uh, in this project, and it's really a project involving uh, um, collaboration between uh, fundamental experimental uh, measurements and our modeling colleagues uh, in, um, in uh, Madrid and Belgrade, uh, uh, and another team in Australia who take our scattering information and use that to inform the models that they then, uh, and then use. So we're interested to know if we can quantify these positron interactions in a, in a way that's useful. Can we then use that data um, to help model uh, positron transport ultimately in, uh, in soft matter? At the moment it's in, uh, in gases and liquids. Um, and can we use this information in some way to improve the efficiency or the efficacy of, uh, of these PET scans? Uh, and can we, another sideline that we have here which I won't talk about is that can we develop new delivery methods for, uh, for PET isotopes? So some of the measurements that we've been involved in up until now involving uh, biomolecules, of course, some simple things like water. Uh, these two molecules are analogs. This is, um, THF or 3-hydroxy THF for analogues of the uh, deoxyribose sugar component of DNA. Uh, we're interested in some of the building blocks of um, uh, molecules of DNA, pyrimidine and purine, uh, and also looking at, um, at the DNA and RNA bases. Well, I'll show you um, some measurements that we've, we've recently done on, uh, on uracil. So we're interested with these molecules in building up a in a sense, a database of all of the ways in which positrons interact with biological molecules, and then hopefully using that uh, in ways in which we can uh, model the transport of positrons in those media. The cross sections look like this. This is a series of, of uh, molecules, water, THF, pyrimidine, and uracil. Um, as the molecules get bigger, typically the total scattering cross section gets bigger. So in the case of uracil, this is a very big cross-section here. This is uh, uh, 60 square angstroms of 10 EV. At much lower energies, it goes up to several hundred square angstroms. So it doesn't, not surprising, uracil is a big molecule and you would expect the cross-section to be large. Um, if we look at the detail of positronium formation cross-sections for a couple of these molecules, this is formic acid, uh, another building block uh, molecule, uh, and water. And we can see that roughly the cross sections for, for positronium formation scale, the bigger the molecule, uh, the more likely you are to pick up uh, an electron from it and form positronium. And again, these are big cross sections. So this is an, an a, uh, inelastic event, but it has a magnitude of five square angstroms. So it's a, it's a large cross section on atomic uh, physics scale. Um, this is a collection of positronium formation cross-sections for a range of these, uh, of these molecules from water up to uracil. And you can see we go from 10 electrons up to 58 electrons. And here we have the last few um, picoseconds of a positron uh, in, in one atmosphere of water. 
So it enters here on the left hand side with an energy of about um, uh, 800 electron volts. Each of these little different coloured balls here represents a different process uh, from elastic scattering through excitation and ionisation processes so they can all be identified. These little blue curves that go off to the side are secondary electrons so we can also follow those electrons uh, with real electron scattering data uh, and see what happens with those. The end of the life of the positron occurs here where it's thermalized enough that it forms positronium and annihilates. So that's the end of this track. But at this point, there was an OJ collision took place. And the OJ electron went off along this track and produced a bunch of other secondary electrons, one of which ended up in a dissociation process with the water molecule. So this sort of detailed information, and I should say this is based on the best scattering cross-sections that we have. Uh, both electron and positron. This sort of information we can uh, now use at the sub-micron scale to follow uh, these particles and to look at energy deposition and uh, the types of processes that are occurring at the, uh, at the um, um, essentially getting towards the nanoscale. So nanoscale dissymmetry is what we're, we're aiming at. There are a number of other things. This is um, some data from uh, Petrovich's group in Belgrade a number of other ways that we can follow these particles. We can look at the distribution of collision events. There's vibrational, uh, excitation, ionization, rotational, etc., uh, as a function of energy of these uh, positrons. Deposit in the medium. In this case, we've got a mixed medium. So this is water plus uh, methane. We put in cross sections for two, uh, for two different molecules. And the, the aim here is to build it up uh, so we can do it for a range of uh, of target molecules at the one time. Um, we can look at, again, this is something similar from the Belgrade group looking at these tracks. Um, uh, and in this case, I forget the, inc the incident energy here was several hundred, 800 EV. And this positron that's followed here produces roughly 10 secondary electrons between 800 electron volts and the point of annihilation here. So there's a lot of interesting chemistry that takes place as a result of, uh, of secondary electron production. Again, uh, we can look at the spatial dependence of the energy deposition, both for the electrons and positrons. So this is for different uh, processes. Uh, uh, the main one here being positronium formation, uh, this, this top curve up here, because that's the biggest energy loss process and the, most, uh, the biggest cross section. And um, Again, looking at distribution of collision events from the origin of the, of the positron. So mostly what happens early in the piece is rotational uh, and uh, rotational excitation uh, for the positrons here and then rotational excitation for the secondary electrons that are, that are produced. So we can map all of these processes now with some certainty because it's based on real scattering data. Um, I wanted to finish up here just trying to provide a point of contact with the electron people in the audience um, because what a major process that underpins a lot of electron physics is this process known as, is, um, as attachment uh, where we have an electron attaches it to a molecule to form a negative ion. It might just scatter off in which case this is a sort of transient resonant state or this negative ion might dissociate. So it might fragment. And so we have either these resonant processes that enhance cross sections, vibrational, elastic, electronic excitation, or we have this process known as dissociative attachment, uh, which results in the formation of free radicals and, and uh, negative ions. Um, and I think coming to these sorts of meetings over the last 15 years, this has been a process which has really been at the heart of of the electron chemistry that everyone in the, in the field has been talking about, in particular in relation to, uh, uh, to biological systems. And we're really interested to know um, uh, if, is there a, what can we learn about positron chemistry? And in particular, I've, I've pointed out that um, we're interested in the major process that leads to uh, production of gamma rays for imaging is this positronium formation. 
We're interested, are there ways in which we can enhance that process through the formation of bound states, binding a positron uh, uh, to an atom or molecule and thus enhancing the probability of overlap of the positron and electron wave function and thus enhancing the uh, annihilation probability. And there's some beautiful data that comes from the, um, a group in San Diego, um, from Cliff Serco's group, where they've demonstrated positron binding to large molecular species. Uh, and these are, these are effectively measurements of the annihilation cross-section, not positronium formation. And we see huge enhancements here, uh, which are due to the formation of vibrational Feshbach resonances. This positron attaching uh, uh, in a, uh, a, a vibrationally excited state of a positronic complex uh, and enhancing the, the annihilation probability. And there's a number of models around for, um, uh, for both atoms and molecules as to how this might proceed, that the positron in some sense polarizes, as electrons do, polarizes the charge cloud of the atom and then that, uh, that polarized atom has a shallow potential which can loosely, uh, weakly bind the, uh, the positron at some large radial distance and you get a bound positron complex. The other way is that the, uh, the positron strips an electron away and forms a positronium complex and that positronium complex is then loosely bound to the, to the um, uh, remaining positive ion. So there's a number of ways that uh, we're looking at in our work is to try and, uh, and, and gather whether positrons do in fact bind to atomic species, uh, and if they do, what's the extent of that, and what are the consequences for, uh, for, for annihilation. So just to conclude, I think we're now in a position where we have a body of collision data uh, uh, available for the, these positron interactions, and this is growing steadily. We're now at uh, a range of biologically relevant molecules. Uh, these are informing or underpinning sophisticated Monte Carlo approaches um, that are being developed and, and continually uh, developed. So we're looking to have, in the near future, positron uh, transport models in gases uh, and a capacity to extend this to the liquid state to take into account interactions uh, in the liquid state between molecules. Um, we now have a capacity to do this in multi-component systems. It's been done up to now in, in a mixture of water and methane, but basically anything we, can, we have cross-sections for, we can combine into a, uh, into a multi-component species. Um, really reaching into the nanoscale now, uh, sub-micron information regarding the energy deposition and damage, and Gustavo, I think, will say something about that uh, his talk, um, and our ultimate goal is towards this positron nanodissymmetry. Can we use fundamental uh, positron scattering information to, uh, to achieve this? Um, I guess the final thing I wanted to say is through, um, through CSIC, through uh, Gustavo's activities, there's a, clearly a very strong link into rabbit uh, as uh, CSIC is one of the major na international nodes for, uh, for rabbit. But we also have this, this other loop here involving our measurements at ANU, the Institute of Physics uh, at, in Belgrade with Zoran Petrovic, uh, and a modeling team that we have at one of our universities in Australia. Uh, and so I think there is a real possibility for us through this link here to have some research projects that can involve a, uh, an, an Australian link, if you like, uh, and for students who would be interested potentially to spend some time working with positrons in Australia, then there are plenty of opportunities, I think. So with that and my very croaky voice, I'll say thank you. It's an, un, it's an annihilation cross-section. So it's a, a, it's a measurement where they just inject a, a pulse of positrons 
into a gas and they, it's a kind of a reflect and experiment. They do multiple passes and they just measure the, the uh, a number of annihilation events. Are there measurements around measuring decomposition of uh, Yes. There's some very, very scant and quite old measurements that came from a group at Oak Ridge probably 20 years ago where they've seen following positronium formation, the subsequent um, fragmentation of the molecule that was involved. And we don't plan such we, we can't do such experiments in, our, in, our, um, in the present geometry that we have, but we do have plans to take the positron. The problem is that the positrons are in this strong magnetic field. We, we have plans to take them out of the magnetic field and then to do measurements such as that. There's a whole range of things that we could do. I was curious about something you mentioned in the beginning of your lecture about the uh, uh, positron therapy. Mm -hmm. Because usually we are we, we get used to hear the positron mentioned only to diagnosis. Uh, what's the principle there? Do we also inject the patient with the uh, radio pharmaceutical, or do we focus the uh, acceleration? Yeah, I've only seen a few <laughs> few papers on uh, on positherapy, as it's called. But the principle is to inject it and to use the annihilation gamma rays to uh, to to do some damage. The energy yeah. is higher than the, the one used in diagnosis. Uh, no, the energy is the same. So the two gamma rays, it's just the conversion of the rest mass of the electron and the positron into gamma ray energy. So uh, I'm not sure how widely it's been used. I've just read there's been a few papers that have been published on, on its potential application. I mean, in some sense, it's, um, it's a, it's a um, a younger brother of hadron therapy, if you like, and particularly anti-proton therapy, which is being investigated at a very experimental stage in CERN, where you could uh, where you could deposit an anti-proton, and the annihilation of the anti-proton leads to an enormous amount of energy production in gamma rays. And so, there's there are thoughts that that could be used as a as a therapy, but of course, not everyone has a anti-proton collider in their hospital. So, no. Yeah. Uh, what is the precise limit of the, the molecules you can measure? Uh, there's no, no, as long as we can put it into a gaseous form. So, so the is the gaseous form. Yeah. So most of the DNA bases are, are powders. They come as a solid. So we have to have a little oven in our beam line to heat these, uh, to form a gas. But as long as we can make a, uh, a gaseous sample, we can do a measurement. Yeah. Well, I like this one, one, one very small point. If you make a original picture of the Earth as a... Yeah, it's, it's great. You can buy this stuff, right? <laughs> oh, what have I done here? Oh, I think I've went... It's just a bit slow. Yeah. So I just wonder, it says net weight 10 ounces. Yeah. Should it be minus 10 ounces? <laughs> <laughs> well, you raise a very interesting, yes. very interesting question because there are um, there are a number of, of I think very intriguing experiments taking place at the moment. Perhaps the most intriguing is at CERN, where they where they um, use a trap like we have here for positrons. Uh, on, on one side, and they take <coughs> antiprotons out of the out of the ring at CERN, decelerate those, and trap them, and then they have a they bring the two together and they mix the antiproton and the positron to form antihydrogen. And I'm sure many of you have been following this. It's one of the big science stories uh, going around. But now they can produce you know of the order of a thousand antihydrogen atoms, and they can keep them for um, for 15 minutes in this, uh, it's basically a, a, um, a, a magnetic trap that traps them according to the, because of the magnetic moment of, uh, of the anti-hydrogen. And so the next stage is that they want to interrogate that anti-hydrogen spectroscopically. So they want to measure the Rydberg levels of, uh, of anti-hydrogen to look for what is believed to be an asymmetry between, uh, in, phys in, in, in the best physical laws that we have, which would indicate why we don't have any 
why there isn't an anti, uh, uh, it's probably a good thing there isn't an anti you out there, but why there isn't an anti, uh, uh, an, an anti world somewhere that we, uh, because if, if we look in our universe, uh, we, we can't see any, any production of. There's a possibility that it can fall up, that's what we Well, that's the next point. So there's a plan for an experiment um, uh, at University College, in fact, to look at, um, at, at whether positrons, what happens under, what, what's the effect of gravity on, a, on an antiparticle. Uh, and that could either be on a positron or a positronium. So, so there's some really beautiful and intriguing experiments that are taking place to try and unravel some of these mysteries. Yeah. So if you use a, a particle that is uh, positronium, can this positron be considered as a free particle away from the uh, molecule? Absolutely. Create it and then be annihilated? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so in fact you can make, uh, we probably do it all the time, but we don't take advantage of it. What is the lifetime of a free positron? If it's in the triplet state, the lifetime is 140, 142 nanoseconds. So you can make positronium in a collision, say, with a rare gas atom from a jet, and it's typically produced in the forward direction, so you can actually get a beam of positronium, and they have such beams at, um, at UCL in London, and then you can use the positronium to scatter off, off particles or surfaces and do experiments with positronium. Yeah. The, so you can make it either in the triplet state where the spins are aligned, or like that, or in the singlet state where they're anti-parallel. The singlet is not so useful or interesting because the lifetime's only uh, 100 picoseconds. Okay. Mm. Well, I, I have a quick question, Steve. Mm. You mentioned about this nanodosimetry. Um, so can you just briefly just tell us a little bit more about that, well, especially because we have students here. Yeah. It might be something that I'll leave for Gustavo. Oh, okay, right. He, he's certainly more qualified than I, but I guess the idea is now that with our data, with, with real data, that's, I mean, a model is only as good as the data that you put into it. Yeah. And most of the models that are out there uh, in use for positrons at the moment probably don't have any positron data in there. They're all based on electrons. Um, so the idea is to put real data into these models and then to look at the energy deposition at the nanoscale in a, in a, in a material. But I'm sure Gustavo will uh, elaborate on that in his talk. Okay, we thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, at this uh, initiation of the, the RABBIT program. And it's, it's great to be part uh, of this initiative. And I'd like to start by really acknowledging uh, the leadership that Paolo's shown in terms of pulling this program together and I'm sure uh, what will be a very successful program going uh, forward. I'm going to talk today at the sort of physics biology interface particularly around aspects of our understanding of how advanced radiotherapies work in the clinical setting from an understanding of the underpinning radiation biology. And to do that, I'm going to start off with a little bit of the rationale for why we want to use radiotherapy uh, as an anti-cancer agent, uh, really to put us all on the same uh, page here, particularly for the students in the audience. I'm going to talk about some of the models that are available for understanding radiation effects in biological systems, what we mean by advanced radiotherapy, some key issues around spatial and temporal aspects of its uh, delivery, and then finish off with some of the tools we have we're trying to understand this in cell uh, and tissue uh, models. So cancer is an important uh, health issue in the population. One in three of us will develop cancer during uh, our lives. And radiotherapy plays a major role in the treatment uh, of cancer. Uh, and that's because it's a non-invasive uh, treatment technique, has uh, less side effects than a lot of other approaches, particularly uh, chemotherapy, and has the ability to be applied very locally uh, to the tumour. And you can see in these examples here that for many uh, tumour sites, radiotherapy plays an important role. About 50% uh, of all cancer patients uh, receive radiotherapy as part of their uh, cancer uh, treatment. 
And we know a lot about how radiation acts in biological systems. And it acts via what we call a double-edged sword. It's very effective at killing uh, cells, hence its use uh, in cancer uh, therapy. But if cells survive a radiation exposure, they may have some changes uh, in their genomes. So it's a potential mutagen uh, as well. And it's getting the balance right between these two aspects that we need to think about from a biological context if we're going to use uh, radiation uh, as a therapeutic agent. So what is radiotherapy? Radiotherapy is the medical use of ionizing radiation to inactivate cancerous cells while sparing healthy tissues. And what we try to do clinically is deliver a high dose of radiation to tumors to kill as many cells as possible and minimize the dose to normal tissues to avoid any damage uh, to those uh, via uh, late side effects. And there are several different ways we can do this clinically. We can use external beam uh, sources such as high energy Linux for producing photons and accelerators for producing ions. We can locally apply radiation into the patient via brachiotherapy, delivering uh, needle sources uh, surgical, surgically, or we can use what is called radionuclide therapy, uh, targeting uh, biological uh, agents with radioisotopes attached to them uh, into the patient. And all of this gives us, as I mentioned, several advantages. We get localized control uh, of the cancer. It can allow for preservation of normal uh, tissues because of its localized uh, nature, and a lot of patients can be treated with radiotherapy because it's much less harmful uh, and stressful uh, than undergoing surgery, for example. Disadvantages are essentially around potential damage to normal tissue uh, as radiation enters uh, the human body. And some of the treatments uh, can be protracted over uh, many uh, weeks. So let's remind ourselves of how radiation acts uh, at the cellular level. We have energy deposition uh, here, the physics and chemistry of the initial events of a radiation response causing damage to the cellular DNA. In particular, of the range of lesions that get produced in the DNA, it's DNA double strand breaks where the helix uh, falls apart in response to direct energy deposition that is thought to be the key biological uh, lesions here which drives the subsequent biological response. Cells can take these double strand breaks and repair them and the cell will survive. Cells find these double strand breaks very difficult to repair, however. Some may not be repaired correctly and there's a probability that that cell may change, may inherit some mutations and transform and could, for example, lead to the production of a secondary tumor. And some double strand breaks uh, are impossible for cells to repair. And it's these unrepaired double strand breaks that will ultimately lead to the cell's uh, inability to survive uh, and cell death. Now, as well as this direct DNA damage model, uh, and I should say that energy deposition really occurs via two main routes, direct energy deposition on the helix itself or indirect via the hydrolysis uh, of water. Our ideas of how radiation acts in biological systems is going through a series of changes. And we now have what's called the non-targeted uh, effect model. Whereas as well as these direct effects, we can have downstream uh, effects which impact on biological response. These include biological signaling mechanisms releasing in response to a DNA damage signal, and then changing a, a progeny of cells as they divide in response to a radiation signal via the process of what's called genomic uh, instability. Key to this is what's called bystander signaling, uh, and that's a biological response where in response to direct uh, radiation uh, damage to a cell, will release signaling factors which allow its neighboring cells to respond in some way to this indirect uh, signal uh, uh, being produced. Uh, and this is an example of what we call a non-targeted effect. It's a response which does not follow the standard model of biological effect where everything occurs in direct proportion to energy being deposited uh, in the DNA uh, of the cell. 
So that's a little bit about sort of the fundamentals of how radiation is acting at the cellular uh, level. Let's try to consider this in a bit more detail when we uh, consider what are called advanced radiotherapies. This is an example of something which is not an advanced radiotherapy. The old way of delivering radiotherapy into patients, two or four large beams, uh, essentially producing a square of radiation dose within the patient. And if this is a prostate tumor here, you can see you can equally, you can very easily cover this dose with this, what's called a 3D conformal uh, beam. But you'll also see that a lot of normal tissue gets exposed to high dose uh, in this treatment uh, volume. Technology allows beams to be delivered much more what we call conformally uh, now. And that's with high energy Linux here, in the treatment head of the high energy LINAC, we have a device called a leaf collimator. This is a series of tungsten leaves which can dynamically shape the beam as the treatment head is around the patient. And what this allows you to do is to take your prostate tumor uh, here and conformally tailor the dose around that by delivering different shaped beams in from multiple uh, directions into uh, the patient. Uh, this is intensity modulated uh, radiotherapy, an example of what we call an advanced uh, radiotherapy uh, treatment. The dose is highly conformal, uh, but you can see there are other issues with it. Some areas of the patient still get exposed to uh, a low doses, and those can be relatively uh, large volumes. And there's very, very steep dose gradients here close to the tumor and close to surrounding uh, normal tissues. If you look at individual cells within this tumor, so if we consider individual voxels within this tumor, they all see different patterns of dose distribution. So these are just nine different volumes within this tumor looking at the metering of dose with delivery at time for a standard uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy plan. So you can see this cell here initially sees a little bit of dose, then there's a gap, then it sees some more dose, then there's a slight sees a short burst of dose, then a gap, some more dose, another gap, and some more dose. And the amount of dose it sees at each of these instantaneous moments uh, changes. And what this cell here sees is somewhat different from this cell here. So it depends where uh, that cell is within the tumor volume in terms of the dose metering. Uh, that it receives in real uh, time. So these advanced radiotherapies deliver radiation in a very uh, complex uh, way. And we need to understand the consequences of this uh, spatial and temporal delivery of dose if we're going to be able to model how to use these effect therapies uh, effectively and predict clinical outcomes. And that's where we have a big problem because our radiation biology knowledge is based entirely on what we call uniform exposures of biological to radiation uh, dose, well removed from what happens uh, clinically. Uh, and this underpins a lot of what uh, we're trying to do, uh, at least in, in my own group at the moment, is trying to understand what are the key aspects of spatial modulation uh, of radiation dose, temporal modulation, so the time dependency of that dose metering and the impact of intercellular uh, signaling. Because I think if we can understand a little bit more about these, we can essentially develop new biologically optimized models for radiotherapy. Feed in the physical dose information and then look at the impact of the biological consequences of that physical dose uh, in ways of uh, optimizing therapy delivery. So to do that, we need to understand at a fundamental level how single cells actually respond to localized radiation dose. So we need to take a step back from the clinical situation. And the way that we do that is to use what's called a microbeam. Now microbeams are essentially ways of producing very localized uh, radiation dose in a situation that allows you to target each cell within a population under controlled conditions one cell at a time to select cells within a population that you want to irradiate and others that you don't. And if you have a, a high enough resolution probe to select regions within a cell where you want to deposit uh, your energy. And what microbeams allow us to do is what is called dose painting, deliver dose into cells 
in a painted uh, way uh, in terms of looking at the interactions of that with iron bands that can be down to the low dose limit of an individual uh, track traversal and then to use to, to, to test for spatial resolution uh, and impacts of dose metering within cells uh, and within uh, populations. Now there are a range of microbeams uh, out there. Uh, the one that I'll show you as an example today is a soft x-ray uh, microbeam and this uses characteristic K-shell uh, x-rays either from carbon, aluminium or titanium. And these uh, K-shell uh, ultrasoft x-rays have different energy deposition uh, patterns depending on their energy tissue level and also in the way that they deposit uh, their electron track ends uh, at particular structures uh, within the cell. Uh, down with carbon here which is relatively low energy most of the secondary electron and energy deposition events are occurring on the sort of nanometer uh, scale here. So how do we produce a microbeam with uh, soft x-rays? Essentially, we use uh, diffraction lenses, uh, devices called zone plates, which allow us to take an instant uh, beam and focus it to a defined uh, spot size, typically uh, subcellular uh, dimensions. This is the system we currently have at Queen's University at present. Uh, this is our uh, soft X-ray microbeam uh, here. It consists of an electron gun firing target, firing electrons onto either a carbon, aluminium, or aluminium uh, target in this chamber here. And then those x-rays are extracted out of the top through the zone plate. Uh, and then we can apply uh, or place a biological uh, sample on here, normally cells uh, grown in a, a culture uh, dish. Uh, and we can then image and target those cells one at a time uh, with these focused soft x-rays. And here are some examples of the types of energy deposition patterns that you can look at. It may not be very clear here, but the blue blobs here are individual cell nuclei of a population of cells sitting uh, on uh, a plastic uh, dish. And what we've done here is delivered a line of radiation across this dish and then stained for a marker that shows up the presence of breaks in the DNA, particularly double strand breaks. And you can see there's a bright green fluorescent signal here right across the dish. We can take a single human cell, and this is the nucleus of a primary human fibroblast, and locally irradiate it uh, with a, a sub-micron uh, spot uh, of radiation here. So this is producing a DNA damage signal within this cell uh, nucleus here from carbon K uh, ultrasoft uh, X-rays. And then we can look at the consequences of that localized irradiation in terms of cellular uh, response. So microbeams are important technologies. They allow localized production of dose and the metering of that into biological uh, models. So I'll show you another example of what you can do uh, with this technology. And this is an experiment where essentially we're comparing the effects of irradiating every cell within a dish with these soft x-rays with the extreme example of just selecting one cell within uh, a population and locally irradiating it. And then we then ask the questions, do those cells survive that radiation exposure? So this is uh, survival here on the y-axis versus the dose of radiation uh, deposited into those cells, comparing the situation where every cell in the population was irradiated and the extreme of only one cell being irradiated. And you can see that the plots here are, are different from each other. With increasing radiation dose, uh, delivered uniformly to the population, we see a gradual loss uh, of uh, cell survival. In the situation where we only irradiate a single cell, we also see a biological effect. Initially at low doses, this is very similar to the situation we get uh, with every cell in the population, but then it saturates out at about the 10% cell killing level. Remember, we only targeted a single uh, cell here but we're getting 10% of the cells in the population being killed by this localized irradiation. And that's with signaling uh, via a bystander response under these conditions. So microbeam experiments have been very informative of telling us how individual cells respond to localized uh, irradiation. And what they're telling us, it affects at the single cell level can't be extrapolated from population studies where every cell is uniformly irradiated.
So the current models we have for understanding uniform exposures uh, don't take us into the place of understanding how individual cells actually uh, respond to localised irradiation. And that has important consequences for how we understand clinically advanced beams. So do normal targeted effects play a role in the clinically relevant dose distributions? Well here um, we have to go into the clinical world. We have to start looking at the response of cells as a biological readout to clinically uh, relevant beams. So this is one of our high energy uh, Linux at the Northern Ireland Cancer Centre. This is the patient uh, treatment couch here and here's the multi-leaf collimator uh, in the treatment head that we can use to shape the beam. So instead of having a patient on here, we have a, a phantom consisting of some solid water and some liquid water with a flask of cells uh, sitting here in the treatment field. And we've asked the question, how does this cell flask respond to the situation where it's uniformly irradiated with the dose of radiation or where it's treated with what we call a modulated beam? So using this beam, using the multi-leaf collimator to shield essentially 50% uh, of uh, the flask, as shown uh, here, producing this deep beam profile here. So this part of the flask sees uh, a, the, the uh, delivered dose. This part of the flask sees only scattered uh, penumbra dose. This is what we call the infield region, and this is what we call the outer field region. So this is a response of these cells, these are prostate tumor cells, to uniform exposure conditions, increasing dose leading to decreasing survival. This is the response of cells which have only been sitting in the infield region of this modulated beam profile. And you can see already we're getting some deviations from what we predict from the normal uniform exposure curves. If we look in the outer field regions, so these are the shielded cells only seeing a scattered radiation dose, we also see a biological effect here. And in fact, we, show, we, we see a very steep uh, response versus the scattered uh, radiation dose. So we've gone from this situation here to, in response to a modulated beam, two different responses of the cell population that we're observing uh, here, neither of which can be predicted from the uniform uh, exposure uh, conditions. So what is driving this difference here? Well, one way we can test to see if this is a biological signaling mechanism is essentially to do an experiment where, in response to this modulated beam here, we have two fast flasks which are physically separated from each other. And then look at how dose uh, metering in flasks uh, leads to uh, a biological response. So here's the data from the top panel here. This is what we get in the outer field response here of a single flask. And here's what we get in this flask here if there's no intercellular or physical communication occurring between the two flasks. Essentially we can switch off this response here. So this is telling us that it's signaling going on between cells inside and outside of the beam uh, that's leading to changes here. Now in fact we know a lot about these bystander responses from a biological perspective. I'll not go into the complexities of this but there's a lot of molecules released by cells when they are irradiated many of them very similar to mo uh, molecules which play a role in inflammatory uh, responses in biological systems. And we know some of the key players uh, that map responses under what are called bystander conditions. And needless to say, if you do these experiments and then add in an agent which quenches uh, some of these signaling molecules, in this case uh, a drug called aminoguanidine, you can essentially reduce the outer field response here by quenching this signaling, again suggesting that there's a lot of biology here uh, going on uh, and driving responses. So intercellular signaling uh, appears to be important here. Does it matter about the spatial dependence, the, sorry, the temporal dependency of this? Does it matter how long it takes to deliver your radiation under these modulated beam uh, conditions? So this is another experiment, again, where we've taken a flask of cells uh, in this case, they're sitting in a PMMA phantom. We've put them on the treatment couch, and we've actually used the therapy planning system to plan the treatment dose to this flask, assuming that there are two organs of risk very close to that flask that we want to avoid. And then we've taken different types of advanced radiotherapy, 
delivery plans and mapped out how we should deliver dose into this uh, flask to give the same overall dose uh, to the flask, but simply delivered, uh, in this case, in four different uh, ways. Now, under these conditions, depending on how the, the dose is metered into that flask, what the cell sees is completely different metering of dose uh, with time. This is what happens if you were to give a, a uniform exposure to that flask. So dose would meter up immediately in proportion to the dose uh, rate, uh, and depending on the dose rate, the total time taken to deliver that dose. This is a situation where we have what's called a nine-field IMRT plan. So this treatment head moves around the flask to nine different positions and delivers a little bit of dose. You can see the exposure is highly protracted and dose is metered in, in a very stepwise process. And some of the other advanced radiotherapy protocols uh, are intermediate in terms of spatially and temporally how this dose uh, is metered in. So this is a complex uh, graph here looking at the total delivery time and the impact on that and cell uh, survival. But there are really two things to, to take away from it. The top line here is what happens if you give a uniform dose to, to cells and then just merely extend the delivery time. We get what's called recovery of survival because you're allowing more time for cells to repair the damage uh, as the dose is slowly uh, metered in uh, to the system. And this is the standard recovery response that we'd expect to see here. If we give a modulated beam, you can see that we lose this response completely. And it doesn't really matter which of these modulated treatments uh, you give here, you lose this recovery uh, response. And essentially what this means is that again, any data that we have from uniform beam exposures can't easily be transportable into the field of modulated beam uh, exposures. There are differences in the way that cells are integrating dose with time uh, when an advanced uh, modulated beam is delivered in comparison to uh, a uniform exposure. So I think I'm, I'm sort of coming towards uh, the end of my time now, so let's summarize what I've uh, covered. Radiotherapy is a key treatment uh, in cancer uh, and is going through tremendous technical advance in how it's delivered at the patient uh, level. And in current advanced radiotherapies, this has important consequences for how dose, physical dose, is metered in uh, to patients, both tumours and normal tissues, both spatially and temporally. Uniform exposures are not delivered at the clinical uh, level. So we need to understand this and how do we do that? One extreme is to actually step back uh, and understand the individual cell level, what are the key, the key drivers uh, of biological response? How does physical dose uh, lead to changes at the cell level depending on where it's delivered at the single cell level and how it's delivered within populations of cells? And microbeams are certainly producing a lot of information in that space. If we go to more clinically relevant exposures, it is clear that depending on where cells sit within the treatment field and outside the treatment field, they respond differently. And that's because dose has been metered in uh, in different spatial and temporal configurations. In modern treatments now, significant dose gradients exist uh, around the treatment field. Uh, and it's important to understand from a clinical perspective what the impact of, of those dip gradients are, particularly if we are interested in protecting uh, normal tissues. From a biological uh, perspective, it's now clear that as well as direct effect driven by direct DNA damage and physical de de deposition, uh, bystander responses uh, play a role. And future models need to understand the impact of bystander responses and their interrelationship uh, with direct uh, DNA damage. So I think I'll, I'll finish there and, and finish, unfortunately I've forgotten my acknowledgement slide, but really just acknowledge uh, co-workers on, on, on this work, uh, my uh, colleagues in the radiation biology group, uh, Carl Butterworth and Stephen McMahon, my uh, clinical physics colleagues, Connor McGarry and Alan Heinso, who give us access to the clinical beams, and my uh, radiation oncology uh, colleagues, uh, Joe O'Sullivan and Aidan Cole, who've been uh, informing us of, of how to, to look at some of the relevant uh, clinical uh, treatments that have been used and try and understand those uh, from the biophysical uh, perspective. Thank you.
Um, there are three things that um, I would like to ask you. First, uh, you, you're saying that microbeans can be used at a single cell level. And obviously, knowing nothing about microbeans, I was looking at your pictures, and it looks like it's uh, within the cell you can choose structures. So when you say single cell level, it's not targeting one cell, but structures inside the cell that you can do it. Yes, that's right. And can you do it with different types of energy? So, so the, the, yeah, you, you, you can select different uh, regions within the cell to irradiate, depending on how fine your microbeam probe is. There are several types of microbeams out there. So the example I showed you was a, a soft X-ray microbeam. Um, but there are ion beams out there, uh, mainly working in the proton and carbon ion space, uh, where you can choose the LET of those beams. Uh, and define the energy deposition patterns uh, that you get in consequence to that. And there's also a couple of electron microbeams uh, out there uh, working in the sort of 20 to 80 kV uh, electron range uh, as well. So there's a whole range of microbeams out there, each of which allows you to select the energy that you, you want to work on in response to the types of questions that you might be uh, wishing to ask. So for example, a lot of people have done a lot of studies looking at um, whether you need to directly target the DNA within the nucleus uh, to produce a biological response, or whether it's simply enough to deposit energy into the cytoplasm uh, of the cell. Uh, and in fact, you can get biological responses after cytoplasmic irradiation. You get production of reactive oxygen species, and those indirectly lead to a DNA damage uh, response. And there's several papers have shown that using these microbeam approaches. So they are, they are quite powerful technologies which allow us to, to map out at a fundamental level that cellular response. Just one more I'm sorry, I just had a couple of questions. Um, when, you, when you're talking about the uh, dose gradients, so as far as I understand, uh, all treatments uh, or the dogma for treatments nowadays is that you have to fractionate your dose mm. to get uh, better uh, fields of recovery, mm. if I may say so. Um, now, what if, unless I'm wrong, what you showed is those kinds of treatments have to be different when you use modulated beams. Is that so? So the... the this, the, this is a, really what is a, a, a move clinically now to move using image-guided radiotherapy to replan every time the patient gets a dose. So to tailor the dose to what the tumor like, looks like at the time it was irradiated. So historically what you've done, you'll have planned the patient, irradiated the tumor site, brought the patient back in for the next treatment and used the same treatment planning algorithm to go back in there and re-irradiate. Now the move is towards re-imaging, re-checking, and re profiling the beam for where the tumor is at that particular time. To take into account issues around movement, take into account images, issues around tumor shrinkage, uh, and really to try and optimize the dose delivery as much as, as possible. The other thing that's coming down the line is really a move away from uh, lots of small fractions to fewer, bigger fractions, uh, to try and, uh, depending on the type of uh, tumor, uh, to minimize a lot of the variabilities around having to retreat uh, the patient. So there's a lot of interest in moving to what are called hyperfractionation treatments. Any data on secondary tumors? Due to the uh, limited at the moment, um, but uh, yeah. Steve, you, you may have mentioned it, but can you say a little bit about um, how you think the bystander response is media? Uh, so they, there are two main, main ways that cells uh, signal between each other. They can signal directly through what's called gap junctions, so material can pass directly between uh, cells, or they can release factors into the, uh, the media surrounding them. It's predominantly what are called cytokines, which are signaling proteins that, that move around the body, uh, transmitting information uh, at that uh, uh, level, and there's a whole biology in that space trying to understand those. Was, was that your yeah. question? Yeah. Okay, so we do know a lot about what happens there. Right. What is typically the range of these bystanders in your experience? Yeah. Well, um, we, along with others, have done some experiments using uh, 3D tissue to try and understand um, some of the range implications of these effects. 
And so we've done a little bit of work in a 3D skin uh, model. Uh, and if you give a localized uh, irradiation dose uh, of about a micron in size into that model, you can get signals moving about a millimeter away from that localized uh, dose. The real situation in vivo will probably be highly tissue context uh, dependent. There, are, there is evidence of what are called abscopal effects at the clinical level, which is what are, are called out of field effects. So you have the treatment field of the patient and then you see a response outside of that. These are generally anecdotal uh, responses now, but they are thought to be related to signaling uh, uh, from the treatment area to the other parts of the body. The other thing that does play a role is uh, changes in the immune uh, system in response to localised irradiation. And in fact, there's a lot of work now being done at the clinical level of linking radiotherapy treatments in with agents which modulate and stimulate the immune system so that it can pick up tumour cells that are falling away from the primary tumour and moving into the, um, the periphery uh, of the, the patient. Uh, and again, a lot of the signalling that's thought to play a role at the cellular level from bystander responses may actually play a role in that context as well. So it's, it's an area that there's a, a lot of interest developing uh, around. David. David. Yeah, sorry. Um, the, the, uh, uh, if you take a plan of view in, in heavy iron therapy, in fatty therapy, proton therapy or carbon, and you look at the amount of the tumour which is irradiated, it's a very, very small proportion. Mm. And that would suggest, I've heard it suggested that the, the very heavy iron therapy or iron therapy couldn't possibly work except for the bicep. Mm. So it's not just play a role, but it plays the major role mm. in making iron therapy possible. Is, is that correct? I, th I think it, it, it does play a role, but we don't really understand how it plays a role. So in fact, one of the things we're doing now, um, the technology is now available to deliver advanced radiotherapy into a mouse tumour, the same way you can a patient. So you can take a very small beam and slowly paint the dose into the tumour voxel by voxel. And what that's going to allow us to do is to map out within tumours how they respond to localised uh, irradiation in vivo. And that technology has just become uh, available. It's not quite there yet for iron beams, but it's going to be very important in terms of trying to understand. The therapy does work. Yep. And yet you're only irradiating a very small in fan view area. Yep. Yeah. So, so presumably the bystander effect is fundamental. Well, it, it suggests it is, but we, we don't we don't we don't know. It, it, it suggests it is. Yeah. It's a good question. It's always a good question for my Mm. My question is, is there any reliable number around in the community in the meantime on the relation between dialect and so, For instance, uh, strength rates. So you mean for, for, for water-based energy deposition? Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's a that for uh, low LET radiation such as X-rays and gamma rays, about two-thirds of the effect is actually indirect from water around the DNA. Uh, and yep. One yep. Uh, and that's predominantly water very, very close to the DNA, sort of within a few nanometers uh, of the DSA, essentially, where all those uh, indirect uh, hydroxyl radicals predominantly are being uh, produced. And you can scavenge those out quite easily in, in, in experimental uh, systems and remove that indirect effect. Last question, please. This is just a question following up on the start, uh, related to the, uh, the range hmm. of uh, the bystander effect. And you talked about, I mean, you talked about millimetres and you talked about hmm. some uh, anecdotal evidence, how to feel damage from the dose. Um, in, your, um, in your talk, you showed, you know, very efficient chemical inhibition of the um, bystander effect. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to get a more conformal treatment of sharp edges, would there be any interest in actually putting some of these chemicals mm -hmm. 
uh, in the Yeah, yeah. So the, there's actually um, interest in doing it both ways. It's trying to increase the amount of bystander effect to maximise tumour kill under situations where you can't get enough dose in, and also trying to switch it off if it's likely to be impacting on normal tissue uh, responses. Um, we've got a couple of projects trying to look in that space. Um, again, starting to move more into the in vivo models to be able to interrogate that. But yeah, there is a lot of interest in sort of modulating these, these effects under those conditions. Right, we definitely have to go to the next because we thank Kevin again. Okay.